Hi, and welcome back. My name is Birgit Penzenstadler, and you are here for software analysis and design. Today is our introductory lecture, and I hope you enjoy it. So we're going to talk about who are you and who am I, and we'll talk about the logistics of the course as well as the learning objectives. Let me start with who are you. I like to do a few quick polls at the beginning. So are you an early bird or are you a late night owl? I tend to be more of the early bird. Are you a coffee drinker or are you a tea drinker? I'm more of a tea drinker. Are you totally invested in software since many years ago and you always knew you wanted to go that route? Or is it something that maybe was a little more recent? Maybe there were just some things that came together that made you decide, yeah, that, that could be it. Um, and for me, it's the latter one, and I'll tell you a little bit about that a few slides down. And last, do you already know you definitely want to go into industry, or you might want to pursue an academic career, or you might want to work for a nonprofit? And any or all of the answers that you've given to any of these questions are fine. What's really important to me is that you know your reasons like you know your why and that you remain curious about exploring yourself as well as the world around you so what would you say defines you who are you beyond the labels of i'm a student at this university or i work for this company or i am married to this partner or i have two kids, or I still live with my parents, or I have two cool roommates. Like, what are the things that are just you inside once we strip away all the outer circumstances and even the things that you do on a daily basis? That's something that is worth exploring when we decide which direction we, we go after this. You will find a few times during this course that while we talk about software analysis and design, I will encourage you to also analyze and design yourself a little bit because I think there's a lot of parallels and we can take advantage of that. So as promised, here's a little bit about me. I was born in this little village. It's called Musinning. It's in Germany. It's in the south of Germany, close by Munich. And we're well known for... Uh, the schnitzel, which is the meal that you see on the upper right. Uh, we are well known for having a pretty good uh, football or soccer team. At the time when I grew up there, when I was born, we had, I think, about the same amount as cows as we had people living in that village. That may have shifted a bit by now because we were relatively close to the new airport. And on the bottom left, you see uh, one of our, well, actually the most famous restaurant in Mosinning that uh, a good friend of mine now runs. And on the top left, you see our very traditional Bavarian costumes that we wear on very festive days. Not only at the Oktoberfest, but yeah, that is happening close by. I went to school in Erding, Germany, which is just a few kilometers from that little um, village Musinning. We're famous for the white beer and for a big thermal spa. And after school, I went to Australia for a bit of work and travel. I sold book for three months and I traveled around for a while and that was pretty cool. And then I did two internships, one at BMW and one at a photography studio because initially I wanted to go into communication design. I wanted to study an arts major, but things came different. And um, because... I didn't get into that art subject and I didn't want to wait a full year to try in another round and apply again. I uh, found this other subject called media and design. I'm like, oh, art history, desktop publishing, design and layout, web design, really cool stuff, all the things I wanted to learn. And then I read somewhere in the fine print, oh, this is a minor subject. 
major subject, computer science. Dang, what am I gonna do now? Well, what I did was um, I went for it. Thought, what could possibly go wrong? And I took uh, a test online that um, supposedly tested, are you likely to succeed in a computer science curriculum? And, and I scored decent, because apparently my logical thinking is all right. And so I just worked on that. And then I actually did get my master's degree in computer science. And one of the most uh, interesting courses that I took there was software engineering. We do need it for all kinds of systems. And there are a couple of challenges in software engineering that are really not that easy to figure out. So there is often a discrepancy in between what the user asked for, how the analyst saw it, how the system was designed, how the programmer wrote it, sometimes with a bit of a crutch, um, and what the user really wanted, or how it actually works. Now, that led me to a diploma thesis in software engineering. Sorry, rewind. That first <laughs> led me abroad when I was fed up a while with computer science. That can happen at any point. I know um, it might happen to you someday, and just don't be too worried about it. Just ride the wave. Um, and Malaga riding wave is not really an option, but Malaga is a city in the south of Spain where I decided to study abroad for a while and to learn a new language. And that gave me a very different perspective and I very much enjoyed it. So if you get the chance to do a semester abroad, I encourage you to do that. And when I came back, that's when I did the diploma thesis, the master's thesis. It was about software product lines at the time. And this was my first touching point with research. And I thought that was really cool like explore on the edge of knowledge where we can actually still discover new things and where I can help make our general knowledge a little bit larger. And then towards the end of that diploma thesis, I started looking around for what I wanted to do after. And I had a few cool interviews in industry, but something wasn't right. I figured that I wanted something more. Now, what is that more? I ended up having an interview with um, Professor Manfred Boy. He is um, at the Technical University of Munich. Well, by now he's retired. He was there. And uh, he led a big research group in software engineering. And we got along well, and so I started doing my PhD with him. And um, by the way, you don't always see the Alps in the background of Munich. This is only when there is wind from the south. But that's how it will look like on every postcard. <laughs> So the dissertation that I then wrote was within the area of requirements engineering. And um, you see, there's a lot of rather formal stuff going on. It's actually not that formal, but being able to express something formally and concise and in a few boxes and arrows that will help um, put a complex story in a small picture that you then can explain bit by bit. Now, because my dissertation work is not the re that relevant for this course. I'm not gonna explain it right now in detail. I might do a different video at a different point in time to, to tell you about that. But I got through the PhD and uh, in the meantime, I realized that doing quote unquote just software engineering wasn't gonna be enough for me. I was really inspired by my passion for nature. I wanted to preserve nature. I read about the Millennium Goals by Jeffrey Sachs. By now you may be aware of the um, Sustainable Development Goals that followed up the Millennium Goals. And so the Millennium Goals targeted some similar areas, but they were just an earlier version. And then I read Lawrence Hilty's work on IT and sustainability and Bill Tomlinson's work on greening through IT. So I decided if I'm gonna pursue this research path, that's where I want to go. I want to see if I can use these 10 years that I had already put in my education and the research to do something good for nature. And then I developed the topic of software engineering for sustainability, which brought me to UC Irvine in California in the US. And I did a postdoc there with Bill Tomlinson and Deborah Richardson. Bill Tomlinson was the guy who started greening through IT and Deborah Richardson is well known in software engineering. And <clears throat> this is in Southern California and yep, I did find some snow because I'm a mountain girl and I love being in the mountains in the snow. 
So on the right side, that's Mio Mambaldi, which is one of the higher peaks or the highest peak in that surrounding area. Spent two years there as a postdoc and then um, published a bunch of things in that area. And towards the end of that, I published Requirements Engineering for Sustainability, which kind of gives you the overview of, hey, if we really want to pay attention to how we can support sustainability in the software systems that we develop, then here are some ways on the left in the context, environment, and problem domain of how we can bring it in. And then here on the right in the requirements, system, and solution domain, here's a few ways of how we can make sure that it gets translated adequately. And then I had a couple of guiding questions. For example, does the system have an explicit sustainability purpose? Which impact does it have on the environment? Is there an explicit stakeholder for sustainability? And what are the sustainability goals and constraints for the system? And some of that work I have afterwards continued like, to this day. We've developed further tools and a framework to make this a little easier to apply for the average software developer who may not have that much education in sustainability engineering yet. And then I went to Cal State Long Beach. That was my first professor position. I became an assistant professor for software engineering and I led the resilience research lab. And there I taught software engineering, requirements engineering, and ICT for sustainability for five years. And I also did a couple of study abroad courses to volunteer in Nepal, where we made some compressed earth bricks and rebuilt some houses after the earthquake that happened there in 2015. I don't know if you remember. But that um, effort is still going on. So Conscious Impact is the organization that I did it with. And if you're curious, just look at consciousimpact.org. They, uh, they are a completely volunteer-run grassroots organization that, that does a lot of good work. And I've learned a lot from them as well. Now, towards the end of that, um, I found this beautiful, beautiful university in Sweden that wanted to have me, and here I am. So, today, uh, at Chalmers and, and Gothenburg University, we come back to software analysis and design. And now you know a little bit more about me and who you're dealing with. And let's turn towards the logistics of this course. We'll look into learning objectives and into the schedule, the examination, um, readings, rules, um, and agreements between you and me. Let's see the learning objectives of this course. So. Um, we differentiate in between knowledge and understanding, skills and abilities, and judgment and approach. And in the knowledge and understanding, you will be able at the end of this course to explain guidelines and heuristics for performing a domain analysis, and you'll be able to explain how to represent a software system using UML models. In terms of skills and abilities, you will be able to analyze and design software systems using object-oriented techniques, and you will be able to create an UML model that is an abstract representation of the source code. You will also be able to use tools for domain and requirements analysis, modeling, program visualization, and object-oriented program design. And then last but not least, you will be able to analyze how software design principles and patterns impact software quality, and you'll be able to reflect on and resolve inconsistencies between various models used as part of a single systems design. So this also gives you a bit of an idea already of how we're going to work in this course. Because if it was only knowledge goals, and I could just keep throwing a bunch of lectures at you and um, expect you to digest that and then be able to repeat that back to me. I want to do more, though. I want you to be able to do all these things to analyze, to create, to use the tools. And I also want you to be able to judge how good a specific solution is and to reflect on when one design decision makes more sense than another one. And as you see in the software development lifecycle on the left, we are fairly early in the process. So we're right after the planning stage. We uh, um, definitely overlap with requirements engineering. There is like an, an early phase of requirements engineering where there's still quite a bit of planning being done 
and there is a later phase that includes a lot of the analysis of the early analysis and this is right where we get started and maybe you already know about the twin peaks model that says you know actually there are the requirements here and um, there's the design right here and we keep circling back and forth in between the two because we can only talk about detail level requirements once we have made some high level architecture design decisions. So we'll come back to that weaving part a few times in this course, but don't worry about it. Like we'll get all of this done. I'm just saying it's not sequential. We sometimes make it look sequential because that's easier to explain. Instead, it is a continuous process with many feedback loops. Now for the outline, I want you to take a look in Canvas and we can take a look together there. So what we have is on the syllabus, you see the, the course PM with the contact details of also supervisor Razan Guzuri and then our teaching assistants who yes, you will definitely meet and I will introduce them to you. Then you see the course purpose, that you get familiar with the tools, concepts, and methods for object-oriented analysis and design. And um, we use UML, but it's not all about learning UML here. It's really more about understanding how do you develop good design, like what is important for good design decisions. And UML is just one notation of representing design in specific diagrams. And then, we have a tabular overview of all of our weeks here. So right now we're in week 13. So we talk about the scoping of the course, which is what I'm doing right now, and um, the design process. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about the domain analysis, context models and stakeholders, and you will start drafting uh, domain elements of such a context model. And on Fridays, we usually have supervision sessions. And for the supervision sessions, there will be TAs in uh, a Zoom meeting for you, and um, there will be the ability to submit work for feedback, and um, then the week after, your first team assignment is actually due. Also in the right column, you will find the mandatory and the recommended readings, and in the next lecture, I will ask you about those readings. So none of these articles are super long. They're all published research and uh, you can take your time in reading them, but do make sure you have read them by the day you come to that class. So for this upcoming Thursday, I want you to read What is a Requirements Engineer? A little article by Barbara Pech that was published in IEEE Software. So please go ahead and read that. It's just two pages, I think for our discussion on Thursday. And then we go through the weeks here. We will talk about scenario-based models, which are use cases and user stories. We then have a week of self-study over Easter. We uh, will talk about domain modeling in class models and in collaboration diagrams. We will talk about agile towards the end of April. And they'll be first workshop using agile development techniques. And then uh, we'll talk about behavior models in terms of state diagrams and sequence diagrams. There will be uh, a module on design patterns and design guidelines. And then further activity diagrams and component diagrams. And I really care about this one, the long-term impacts of software systems. Because I want you as software developers later on to take responsibility for the long-term impact that your software systems have. And that means I need to understand early on what those impacts of the future could possibly be. And then we will have one more workshop down towards the end. Um, I have to think about how we're gonna do that now because we're teaching remote, but it's gonna happen and uh, this will potentially be research and of course i'm going to ask for your consent for that and i'm going to have some consent forms that uh, where you can decide whether you allow me to to use the data um, for this or not and 
then we'll do a final exam revision because I want you to know that you're going to be prepared. You will get some example exams, uh, example exam questions as well. So um, that is something where I definitely want you to know what you're getting into and you will. The course literature down here lists the required reading as well as the recommended reading. And I already listed YouTube videos down here. This was before. Um, we knew we, we were teaching remotely, so now that's a definitive. And then uh, there is a couple of optional reading suggestions further down here. I do like to work with interactive lectures. That is a tad reduced now because of the format that we need to go to. There will be some exercises and readings. So there are some voluntary exercises if you want to practice a little more. And there are voluntary and mandatory readings. There will be some team assignments and I may reduce the amount of that because uh, of the given situation. It may be harder for you if you're not used yet at remote working in teams. And so I'm going to make sure that this is not too hard on you. And in supervision sessions, you will have the opportunity to ask specific questions and to get feedback on drafts of your assignments. This is also while the assignments, uh, why the assignments will be published quite a bit ahead of time. And then we have a couple of workshops that will allow us to dive deeper into a given, given topic. And um, some of that will go towards research and when it does, I will make that very specific and I will ask you for your consent on specific parts of it and then you can choose how much you wanna participate in that. Feedback, very important stuff, especially as we're teaching remote. Um, I don't see your faces in front of me all the time and therefore it will be super useful for me if I can get feedback on you, uh, from you, how this is going, what works well for you and what does not. And I will definitely ask um, in two or three weeks, like how it's going so far and what your impressions are and ask you for some, some written answers in that. And then down here are the learning objectives and I broke down how exactly the individual assignment will contribute to that. And then, Finally, there are some uh, standard information about the exams and the written hall exam we will have to change because of current circumstances. Um, changes made since the last occasion, or you got a new instructor. That's basically the main change. And um, with that, I um, wanna go back to in the slides. So please do, reach out to me if you have questions. I made a discussion forum right underneath where I'm posting the video in your, um, in your Canvas installation. And if you're watching this on YouTube at a later point, then you can just ignore this little part. And I'm always grateful for your comments and your feedback nevertheless. The examination, there will be a written exam. Um, it will be a take-home exam and um, there will be the assignments. And all of that is pretty much standard as um, it was in, in the course previously. So don't worry too much about it. The exam is valid a little more than the assignments because um, that is your, your individual contribution. And um, we will prepare for everything in detail and in time. Here are some links on uh, the sign up, but I believe we have everybody in here that we need to have. <laughs> Couple of agreements. Um, beyond time, all of us, that has become a little more relative because um, the lectures are online, so you can watch them a few hours later, that's okay. I would ask you to watch them on the same day if possible, just so we can stay a little synchronized, also with asking the questions in the course and also with doing the assignments. Where focus goes, energy flows. So while you're watching the lectures, don't try to do things at a time. Like if you go to reading and responding to your email while listening to the lecture, guess what? It's gonna go in here and it's gonna leave there <laughs> and not much is gonna stick in between. Um, that said, the lectures will probably be a little shorter than 45 minutes at a time because that's really asking for a lot um, sitting in front of a screen by yourself and not being able to talk back to me. I get that. <laughs> so for the time that you do spend with me, 
just decide to get the maximum out of it. And the more focused you are during the lectures, when I speak to you here, the less time you will need in your assignments. Um, if there is any trouble or miscommunication, let's talk about it right away. Like the sooner I know something doesn't work, the sooner we can change it. And that includes when team members or, or I um, don't do what we said, for whatever reason that may be, we need to talk about it. Um, when there are difficulties with assignments, whether it has not been understood well, or whether it's a people problem, we're all humans. Like all of us have stuff going on at the same time and we all need to deal with life. Or whether it's content that you need more explanation on a specific subtopic. Um, and it also includes behavior that is perceived as, as rude or discriminatory. We, like I said, we all go through different struggles in our lives and we all do the best we can. I firmly believe in that. And so when, when you deal with your team members or when you leave comments, you know, we all just will try to do that in an appropriate manner and be, um, be cautious with each other. If we were in a physical classroom right now, I'd ask you to raise your hands and confirm this or to sign a piece of paper. Because we're doing this online, I'm still asking for you to agree to these things. A couple of things about expectation management beyond those agreements. So one of the hmm, maybe difficulties with this course is it involves designing. And if you think about your favorite coffee mugs and the favorite coffee or tea mugs of your friends, they look different, right? Um, you may have different favorite mugs. They're all designed though. They all may be even good design. They all hold a lot of hot liquid to drink inside. And that it's, Kind of the same thing for your assignments. So there are many correct answers for the same assignment. There is not one perfect answer or one single correct answer. And unfortunately, our educational system sometimes kind of drills it out of us. If you want to hear more of that, watch the TED Talk by Sir Edward on education and creativity. Really worth it. Go for it. And he explains really well how our standard school system has the tendency to get rid of our creativity by teaching us, this is how something is done, this is the correct way, this is how you do it. And then you come to university and some courses are still like that because, for example, in math, there is one correct way to do it, period. And then there are other courses where you start designing things and all of a sudden you get an assignment back with, yeah, this is already pretty good. Um, maybe think about this one quality criterion and, and you're kind of not satisfied because you don't have an exact solution to compare with, well, where was I off? Because even if I give you a different example solution, it would just be one possible example solution. It would not be the one correct solution. So there is no unique recipe for, for solving the perfect assignment. You can be creative and you will be learning by doing. And part of it is to just try out different designs and then reflect on why is one design of those better than the other ones or which design of those could be a better one or what are the constraints or downsides of one particular design compared to another one. And all of design requires a good understanding of the problem domain. So domain analysis is a significant part of the course. And when we talk about use cases again, I know that this is the one thing that you probably did before in requirements engineering, it is still important to do that from an analysis point of view. So we're just changing perspective now. And it makes sense to do a little repeater on that. Now I'm really curious to hear what your expectations are. And you have a bunch of options to leave uh, your feedback for that. Like for now, just like take a little piece of paper. Um, let me know your three expectations of this course. And then you can post it on Canvas or you can post it here on YouTube. And um, I want to know what you want to get out of this course. And if you know 
what you want to get out of this course, you will be more motivated and you will know at the end of the course, you will be able to look at, oh, what did I want to get out of this course? Huh? Do I feel like I really got it out of this course? Like, am I satisfied with my learning progress in this course? And if I know at the beginning of the course, I can make sure we actually get there. Or I can tell you, look, that specific thing that you are wanting to get out of the course is actually not part of the course. So I'm not sure we can do that. So take the moment now and write these three, three things down. What are three things that you want to get out of this course? Software analysis and design. Pause the video for a moment if you need longer. last little few comments. Um, just about a view on education. So um, there was this quote from Richard Riley, Secretary of Education under President Clinton in the US, and he said, education needs to prepare students for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems we don't even know that are problems yet. All right, now throw that at the university and be like, all right, here. Prepare your students for jobs that don't exist using technologies that we haven't invented, um, solving problems we don't know are problems yet. So what, what are examples for such new jobs? Right now, there might be a bunch of agile coaches out there that are trying to coach people in how to do agile development. We don't know yet what the next development paradigm is going to be. So there will be some kind of XYZ coach. Uh, GDPR has been a big topic over those past few years. Security is becoming bigger and bigger, so there will be a lot in the area of compliance to those characteristics. And um, there could also be an ICT due diligence assessor that checks whether you're really doing all the things you should be doing. We will get into more um, legal constraints or as the years progress in IT and as we advance further. And so we will need more people that are willing to deal with those constraints and that take care of checking them. And that may reflect on design choices as well. So that means we will be dealing with a lot of um, practical hands-on stuff because we will be analyzing example problems and modeling example problems. Mm. And all these examples are used as a means to increase your skills in thinking, in analyzing, in reasoning, in generalizing, in classifying. Like I said, it's not about you learning how to um, draw a proper UML diagram. Yes, we will do that. And there is so much more. I don't only want you to be able to draw a UML diagram. I want you to be able to look at somebody else's UML diagrams and understand if the design choices they made are good for the system that we analyzed and how that design could possibly be improved and what the trade-offs of the design are, what the drawbacks are and what the advantages are. What patterns might help you solve the design problem better? And we will also use a number of rules of thumb and uh, designer best practices that Andre van der Hoek published in a recent book, um, Decoding Software where he shows 100 of the best design patterns. I will put it in the additional recommended reading and you will see some of those guidelines showing up in the slides from the next lecture onwards. The most prominent is one is you got to get to the most difficult part of the problem. Like what is the most difficult part of the problem that you're trying to solve? Now, concluding this little introductory session, if you help me help you, we can have a really good course. And I'm curious as to what questions you have. So please let me know. Let me know your expectations and let me know your questions. Thank you.